Series folks, this season we're talking with Millennials in the 806, and this one's going to be a fun one. We've got three local winemakers. We've got Spencer with McPherson, Jason with Yano, and David with English Newsom Cellars. So, okay, so for those that don't know, they may not be familiar with Texas wine, right? So what's something about Texas wine that you would tell someone to encourage them to try it? Spencer. Um, <laughs> Well, it's something new. Uh, you don't see a lot of Texas wine out there in general, and it is a definitely an up and coming product that is fabulous. Um, people need to get out there and try it. The quality is top notch. Um, we're out there competing with the world in this, and I think um, we're right up there with them, if not better. So. Do you want to talk about the varietals, some varietals they might find? Sure. Uh, so. Texas uh, originally started out growing the traditional varieties that most people know in the wine world, Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, we've expanded since then to include some obscure varieties, what, what uh, New World American wine drinkers would consider obscure. Uh, French varieties, uh, Italian varieties such as like Sangiovese, uh, French varieties like Morved, uh, Grenache, Syrah. Some people have heard Syrah being called Shiraz. It's the same thing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, right now we're growing everything and anything and seeing what sticks and what does best for our growers and what makes the best wine. And I would just say that Texas wine doesn't suck anymore. You should try it. <laughs> so this region is called the Texas High Plains. It's responsible for, depending on who you talk to, approximately 90% of Texas wine grapes. So what's the climate up here like, David? you want to talk about that, why this area grows wine grapes so well? So one of the reasons that we grow wine grapes so well is, again, like you're saying, we have a great climate. It's not too humid here, so we don't get a lot of like the mildewy, and we don't get a lot of the pests because it gets hot enough here. But also we have kind of a diurnal shift almost at night, kind of like they have in Napa Valley, where it uh, gets cold during the night. Usually we can have like a 20 to 30 degree swing, and then it'll warm up during the day. So usually that's pretty healthy for the vitamin itself. And uh, our soils are also very good for that. We have a pretty good array, I guess, of soils. Yeah, I never thought that would matter, I guess, mm -hmm. the quality of the soil. I mean, it obviously would matter to a degree, but how intricate like, you get into the chemistry of the soil and like what it produces is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, usually the physical characteristics are the what make it important. They drain water well, mm -hmm. and then there's enough clay uh, mixed in. Um, a little, depending on where you're at, it can be shallower or deeper, but that holds some of the water. So there's years where obviously it doesn't rain, like this year. And, um, you know, we rely on irrigation, but without the ability to hold the water at, at, a, at the right depth for the roots to uh, attain it, um, then it would be more of a struggle. Um, so yeah, you want to have that balance of like draining the water so it doesn't stay, you know, totally saturated. Yeah. But not too much <laughs> so that the plants can can uh, gather, you know, uh, actually find water. Right. Survive. Right. Yeah. So, Spencer, you're M. McPherson. Yes. And I'm trying to think, Doc McPherson is considered like the, the godfather of the Texas wine yes, industry or yes. not. So the tell father, a little bit. Not the father. <laughs> not the godfather. <laughs> the the father, godfather yes. is more like crescendo, like, you know. <laughs> so tell them about McPherson and kind of the background with that. Yeah, so uh, Doc McPherson grew up here um, on the High Plains, um, taught over at Tech for a while, and he kind of got the whole um, viticulture side um, going with uh, Dr. Reed as well. Um, we have a vineyard called Sagmore Vineyards that is kind of the, uh, I guess, starting off point. It, there was many varieties that they planted out there back in, golly, probably the 70s. Um, and do you have then, a Sangiovese out we do. there now? Yeah. That's, yeah, that was yeah. incredible. So he came, um, planted a bunch, uh, found out what grew well, thought that Sangiovese was a, a, a great fit up here for the High Plains, like Jason said earlier. Um, and it is, and now we have that vineyard up there, uh, about 10 acres of Sangiovese. Um, but him and Kim now, um, who was over at Yano Estacado for some time as a winemaker, went out to California, was at Caprock as well, um, started McPherson. And um, I think it's in an omed to his father, Doc, who kind of just helped um, 
spur this whole industry up here today. Yeah, so. And Kim's been a semifinalist now twice for James Beard? Yes, twice. Yeah. That's we awesome. haven't won it yet. We're uh, hoping to hey, get it eventually, we'll you know? <laughs> yeah, we will take it. It's a great nomination and we're, we're very honored just to uh, be seen in that light. Uh, so it's a, it's a great accomplishment for yeah. us. That's yes. awesome. Jason, you're at the second largest premier winery in the state of Texas, Yano. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, they say it's the it's the second largest, but the largest premium winery. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> is what the marketing department says. No, but I would <laughs> I would say a lot of people would agree with that. But yeah, I a long history, uh, history rooted in um, the McPherson family founding the winery back in the seventies out uh, far outside of Lubbock. Well, it used to be far outside of Lubbock. Now Lubbock's starting to absorb it back in. But yeah, it was at a time, started during a time when, um, you know, drinking wine and alcohol in general was Forbidden. kind of taboo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Didn't they build it out of like yeah. cinder blocks or something? Uh, they did. Go That's a funny story, story that yeah. needs to be told. Yeah. They, what, yeah, they built it out of <laughs> cinder blocks so that uh, when, pe when they assumed that people were going to come by and shoot at it, which happened. Totally happened. Totally cool. true. Build it out of concrete. Build it out of concrete know, to deflect the bullets. <laughs> They've come around though. People love love their Texas wine now. But they I would say regardless of bullets or weather or whatever, <laughs> the winery has sustained and has been around since 1976. And I want. I think I'm the sixth winemaker, sixth or seventh. I should have counted beforehand. But uh, yeah, the only a handful of winemakers have been through that facility have worked there and um, honored to, to be there and carry on the tradition and help grow the portfolio of wines that range from $6.50 all the way up to $40 or higher. And um, yeah, it's there's a lot going on at yeah. Yano. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, David, you're at English Newsom, formerly Caprock Winery. Do you wanna talk about kind of that joining together? And yeah, so the uh, English family and the Newsom family actually kind of joined together back in 2017, merged. The English family actually owned the Caprock Winery building, which had kind of started to get a bad name, a reputation in the industry. So really they needed just a whole rejuvenation and kind of a kickstart in that sense. So they uh, partnered with the Newsoms, who had been growing grapes for a little under a decade at that point, and uh, they brought the grapes to the winery. And uh, now we control the process from soil to bottle. 100%, and that's kind of our little spiel, is that we have control over everything in the winemaking process, from growing the grapes to packaging and everything. Yeah, that's really cool to have that mm -hmm. kind of contact with it the entire process, so when it gets to bottle, you really know it through and through. Definitely. Yeah, you definitely you get the feeling that you really get to love and understand your wines, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk <laughs> winemaking in the High Plains. What's maybe one thing that you love and maybe one thing that's a little bit of a challenge see one thing i love uh <laughs> it is it <laughs> the is, wine drinking the yeah wine. drinking the wine no no the quality is is um in, is getting better that was one of the i think um turning points in the past uh 10 years since i've been here um the grape quality has has uh jumped significantly and that you know, you can't make a good bottle of wine with bad grapes. It is very difficult. So um, as we turn that point of grape quality, winemaking becomes um, easier, I would have to say, on us. But also um, it just helps us uh, show what grapes um, we can grow up here and what we can turn that into. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It seems like it's a good variety. I mean, the varietals are like... There's, the there's so many of them um, that we're testing out and so many yeah. of them we're finding out do uh, decently well up here. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Y'all want to add I mean, anything? Uh, yeah, you can't, I kind of said it all. It, the, we can't you know, improve the quality of the wines without an improvement to the grapes that are being grown. And the growers, the ones that are really committed um, and that are breaking through some of the, you know, the, the ceilings that were that were thought to be put in place. I mean, those are the ones that, that are standing out. And if we get our hands on those grapes, you know, we're you we're gonna make good yeah. wine. It's kind of a fight to kind of find the yeah. best growers <laughs> out there and to to attack and get those grapes, you know, from maybe Yano or or English Newsom. But there is a lot up here, and we there is a lot to share. And 
every day I think we're finding new growers and these growers are traveling. I mean, they're going to Europe, they're going to Washington, which is another very similar climate to us and learning from them who've, um, who've been doing it for a longer time and bringing back that knowledge and um, sharing it with everybody. So you kind of hit on it a little bit. This area is known for growing. I mean, it's um, pretty, a pretty popular thing out here, obviously. So what does that mean for this industry? Like looking forward as far as like what we could grow? It's diversification. Um, it's different than uh, traditional farming that's gone on around here for a long time. But if you embrace that uh, diversity and that difference and you go all in the same way that you had farmed your previous crops um, and are committed to it, you can do some really, you grow some really high quality fruit that people will pay a premium for and you'll get to see the enjoyment on people's faces whenever they uh, purchase that product and drink it. So it's, yeah, mainly diversification and um, um, just a commitment to a, a different product crop. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's overall changing up here on the high plains. Cotton, mm -hmm. peanuts, um, those are like the big cash crops. And I think a lot of people are f uh, finding out because our growers are actual cotton growers as well and peanut growers that they are turning to wine grapes and it's uh saves us on water and hopefully maybe one day this whole high plains will be full of wine grapes instead of cotton who knows <laughs> hey it's a dream you know there'll be a lot of a lot of acreage <laughs> you have all the grapes you'll, you could want exactly exactly <laughs> you know as we were planning this season we were trying to think of millennials in Lubbock, what they're, you know, different things that they're doing. And one thing that came to mind was you guys being winemakers and being younger and being in the industry. So David, do you want to start how you got into winemaking? Sure. So I was uh, attending Texas Tech. I really didn't know what I wanted to do at that time. I actually read in one of the uh, Texas Tech alumni magazines that we even had a winemaking program. So I was like, huh, that sounds interesting. Might as well take a few classes. So I went and I got a job at McPherson, started working in the tasting room then eventually transitioned to working in the wine cellar, got my degree in winemaking from tech, and uh, the rest is kind of history from there. Jason? Yeah, mine was simple. I just tried a delicious wine for my birth year, and I'm like, I gotta figure out how to make that. <laughs> what was it, do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a life changing. Still taste it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 1982 Chateau Margaux, which is a, a French wine from Bordeaux, and one of those wines that no you know mortal can afford and i had the opportunity to try it no i didn't buy it it was, it was a gifted <laughs> yeah can't afford that one but it yeah it changed the whole tra uh, trajectory of my life and, and so then, i just pursued uh the career path after college and um found my way to lubbock and been here 15 years and it's a great place to live, great place to uh, grow a family. Grapes too, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about living in Lubbock? Cost of living is great, <laughs> so that's a bonus. Um, I like the, we have much more time. I grew up in Houston, like Dave, and you spend a lot of time on the road and commuting and just getting place to place. It's much simpler and quicker and the people are the communities, I mean, full of just like amazing, you know, helpful, you know, just nice people. And you don't encounter that everywhere. Yeah. So I think the time, the time is the biggest thing. We have so much extra time. It's great. Yeah. We can Time's play golf. Time's invaluable. You can't get any more of that. <laughs> what about you, Spencer? What got you into winemaking? Um, well, I grew up in California um, in a small town called Temecula, which is also a kind of wine region in California. And uh, my dad was a big wine drinker. And um, he just said, why don't you get into winemaking? Because <laughs> probably because he wanted to yeah. drink the wine, you know, <laughs> he but the uh, your labor. <laughs> but yeah, so I ended up coming out here to Lubbock and going to school for uh, in that same wine program um, back in the day. And then I also knew Kim McPherson, the owner, and um, I knew his brother and his brother has works at a winery out in Temecula. So I had a connection already. So it was kind of like job and school and everything kind of brought me here. And I've been here now for um, 
11 years. There yes, you go. yes. So it's uh, a. Yeah. <laughs> I got to count that. No, but it, it, is, it is a great place to live. Um, coming from California, it's such a big change, you know, especially from. It was close to San Diego, so, you know, beach and uh, mountains and everything's close by. But um, Lubbock is just uh, the people, I think, does it for me. Everybody's so friendly here. Um, it's such a small town feel, but you have exposure to so much. I mean, Buddy Holly Hall's going in. We got all these wineries. Um, you're very close to New Mexico and the mountains. There's just so much to do here um, for, I think, young, the young generation. I mean, I, otherwise I wouldn't be here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm about to start a family and uh, I'm very excited about that and what Lubbock has to offer. That's so. awesome. I know everyone's happy you're making wine here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, David? Um, one of the things I would like to comment on is that I actually love the climate of Lubbock. I feel like that always gets trashed everywhere. But again, coming from Houston, especially, oh, yeah. you know, 100% yeah. humidity, it's hot as heck all the time. Coming here and actually getting the four seasons and like getting to experience weather, it's awesome. And again, the commuting and the traveling, I don't think I can get anywhere in Houston without it taking 15 to 25 minutes. You know, and that's just yeah. going a couple miles down the street, whereas uh, here you can get anywhere in town in pretty much 12 minutes. So. Yeah, for sure. So if someone were coming to English Newsome, what's a wine that you'd want them to try? I would probably suggest our Picardon. So we we're actually the largest growers of that in the world. And it recently won double guild or double gold, excuse me, at the uh, Tasters Guild competition. So. Is that tell what it, is that a white? Yeah, yeah, it's, a white yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's a white wine. Yeah, oh, so okay. it's a real refreshing wow. Light body white wine, okay. lemon limey, real yeah, acidic. Awesome, that sounds good. Picardon. What about you, Jason? Yeah. <laughs> Tiana, wow, that's like the hardest question in the world. Um, <laughs> well, first, because we make, I got to pick one. This is hard. Um, Let's say they have like a, a decently. Uh, I would ask, palette. you know, what type of wine do you like? Because we literally have. We strive to make uh, a style of wine, several styles, different styles of wine, so that you can find what you're looking for at Yano. Um, I don't know if that's the best strategy, but that's what we do. <laughs> What's your favorite? <laughs> I see that, and I can't answer it. It's kind of like music. It's, you know, or, or whatever I feel like listening yeah. for the day or whatever it is I'm eating, yeah. you know, I'll pair it with a wine. At least what I, or I just feel like drinking something crisp and cold right now. So I'll drink Sauvignon Blanc, or I'll drink Picardine, or I'll drink, uh, you know, Vermentino, or um, it's kind of like whatever I'm personally in the mood for. Okay, Spencer, help me out here. What I'll be a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say our Sangiovese. Uh, I think a it's, good one. it's such an approachable wine. It's a great red Italian wine, um, good acidity. Good, uh, good, great with food, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm a big Italian uh, food eater. Pasta is one of my favorite, and I think it goes hand in hand. And it's, it's uh, the medium bodied range where you can have it with some chicken or, or with a more heavier, heavier dish as well. And again, we, we do eat and drink together. I think that's one thing that we, us as winemakers, do is. Uh, what we are eating, we will match, or what we have to drink is what we'll make. Yeah. So, but yes, try the McPherson Sangiovese. Uh, yeah, it's fabulous. <laughs> From Sagmore Vineyards, uh, yeah. some of that is in there as well. So, so what I, do you guys see? What were you guys say? I was gonna say? Okay, so I have to say a grape. Come try the Tempranillo. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we have four of them. <laughs> so, what do y'all see for the Texas wine industry? <laughs> <laughs> for the region mm. what do you see long term like looking down the road growth yeah. yes big growth yeah hopefully uh, a nationwide presence um, that would be the ultimate goal i think is yes. is to be seen um, in every state or at least uh, have someone's wine from texas and in, in the grocery stores you know so my dad can buy it in california so my aunt can buy it in in boston you yeah. know something like that so that's my dream. Which <laughs> McPherson Cellars does have some presence. They do. We do. On the yes, East Coast. Yes, we are in a, so a few breaking states. Through. 13 states, I believe, total. That's awesome. That's so, awesome. Small presence, but um, we're trying to get our name out there so, yeah. and help out. Um, I think Kim always says uh, a rising tide 
floats Let's all boats. Boat. Yes, yep. yes. He's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of old sayings. <laughs> try to remember them. So. so closing thoughts, if someone were to ask you, or maybe they're thinking about moving back to Lubbock, what would you tell them? David, you want to start? 100%, I would be all for it. There's so many great things that even Spencer was alluding to, like the Buddy Holly Hall about to open up. There's so many great things in this town, and it really is has that small town feel, but it's a big city. I like to call it like a small, big city. You have really everything you need here. So, Come on out. It will surprise you. It's not the Lubbock that you yeah. think you know or yeah. remembered. That's a common it's thing people say. Lubbock. Yeah. 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 Um, from when I got here 10 years ago, um, it was a small town, I feel like. And <laughs> in these 10 years, it has, uh, I think, blown up quite a bit. I mean, there's new construction going up everywhere. And uh, I think whatever you saw 10 years ago, it has definitely changed and there's a lot more to do here. So come out and experience it for yourself and meet one of us on the street and yeah. Or at the winery. Yeah. Or at the winery. Yeah. <laughs> on the street. I walk the street sometimes. So. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, guys. We really appreciate it. So you. Um, if you haven't tried Texas wine, uh, everything's better in Texas. So grab a bottle sometime. Uh, for more stories like this, check out podcast.lubbockeda.org.